Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is season four, where we're focusing on case acceptance. Before we get into the episode, we want to take a moment to thank Blue Sky Bio for sponsoring this season of Shared Practices. Our listeners know I can geek out about Blue Sky Bio. This is something that I love and I'm very passionate about. But Blue Sky Bio has realized that for every one geek that exists that loves playing with all these pieces of software and merging files and designing these things, there's probably four or five dentists that really don't want to mess with all of that. They don't want to be the lab where they're designing their own guides, 3D printing, processing, cleaning up, clipping, trimming, inserting guide tubes. They really don't want to add that workflow by a 3D printer and truly taking the time to integrate this into their practice. Because of this, Blue Sky Bio has introduced something called Lab Pronto. This is truly the Uber of digital dentistry in terms of treatment planning implants, surgical guides, ortho aligners. The way it works is once you're in the software with all the pieces that you need, there's a button that says Lab Pronto. You click on that, and now there's actually a list of labs with available time that you can choose to send your files to. They can help you treatment plan, they can help you print or design the surgical guide, whatever level you wanna be involved with. If you wanna do the design yourself and they print it, you can do it that way. If you want more help, if you want more of their involvement and less of your time, they can do that too. You are able to shop with a number of labs that are within Blue Sky Bio's network that understand what they're doing with this software and can really help you out by maximizing your time so that you can do more surgery, more ortho aligners, more patient care, and act less as a digital lab technician. To access these features, update to the latest version of Blue Sky Plan and just click the Lab Pronto button at the top of the software. Okay, we have with us here today, Dr. Wade Pilling. Wade, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. People may know you from a couple of different places. You're on uh, many uh, Facebook dental page right now, uh, but but I know you from uh, Dental Town, from like in dental school when I was supposed to be studying, when I was supposed to be you know drilling on teeth or something. Instead, I would spend many 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 hours deep in investing threads and you know paying off debt threads and all you know Scott Luna's thread, you know threads that go on and on and on on Dental Town, and um, you had quite the history of amazing investments. And, and I think there was an episode with T-Bone on uh, T-Bone Speaks last year that you did. And at that time, you had part of 10 hotels and like 2.5 car washes. So where, where are we with your passive income right now? Well, just uh, similar avenues, just growing more and more, looking at uh, different businesses. I, I continued on with uh, the hotel investing, cool. uh, continued on with uh, the car wash investing and I branched out into some medical devices. Yeah, I heard about that. How, yeah. how recent was that? Oh, about a year ago. Okay. We came across a, a product that was uh, a company that was kind of going through a bankruptcy, uh, did some issues, had a great product, but just was mismanaged. And okay. there was an opportunity to get in and scoop it up and with some investors and be part of that and help bring it to uh, the public. And that's been, that's been a great investment. You know, just in, the, in one year alone, we made about four times our money back on it. Nice. How much, um, it seems like your other, the hotels and the car wash, once you put that capital in there and things were up and running, you were very hands-off. Was this one a little bit more hands-on? I'm hands off with pretty much anything that's uh, not dental related. You okay. know, I understand dentistry and enjoy it, but you know, I found that my time is precious, and I spend a lot of it, you know, having fun, enjoying my family. <laughs> I have a lot of hobbies I like to enjoy, and and I don't want any investments that's really going to take up a lot of my time. So, sure. pretty much uh, most of those, I found. You know, I'm not an expert in those fields. I just find people that I trust. I make sure I protect myself. And I try to partner with some really smart people and then just hitch my tra- you know, my trailer to them and go sure. along for the ride. So there's a little bit of risk taking, but it's a lot of it just trusting people and getting those relationships of trust and moving forward with them. That's awesome. But pretty much, you know, when it comes to dentistry, I'm pretty much hands on. When it comes to my practice coaching, I'm pretty hands on. But the rest, I kind of just let go passively. Cool. Well, and if anyone wants to learn more about kind of your investing journey. I, I'll put in the show notes that link to that T-Bone episode. Awesome episode. You guys really kind of hammered out like the, the specifics and the details. 
Um, but today, I, I really wanted to dive into what you called your engine, like your your main source of this income that allows you to invest and, and have this passive income and have this lifestyle you enjoy, which is your practice. And um, you have a fairly, I don't know, would you call it high end or at least high end procedure mix uh, practice? How would you describe your practice? I'd, I'd call it high end procedure mix. You know, okay. it, it's, a, it's a fairly niche practice. At least it has been in the past. I'm actually going through the process of bringing in a partner right now because I was a little bit too niched out. Um, sure. I need someone to be able to do a lot of the bread and butter and, you know, expand the scope of the practice where I had pretty much developed, you know, more of a specialty type practice. Okay. So let's, let's get into some specifics with this because, um, to, in order to have the type of high end practice that you have built, you have to be able to get patients to accept that kind of treatment. And, um, so let's let's talk about some of your favorite procedure mix. Like, what what do you love doing in your practice? Um, what have you been passionate about? What is your CE focused on um, in terms of procedures? You know, I I love aesthetic dentistry. You know, a lot of people uh, felt those days were over and kind of ran away from you know doing cosmetic dentistry or or smile makeovers or focusing on that. They saw the need to be more more diverse. And as I saw people running away from that, it just opened up more for me to do. Cool. Sometimes you got to run to where everyone's running away from, you know, mm. if you want to find your niche and be successful. And, you know, I've done that. And so I, I really enjoy people who come to me and just want their smile made over. So, you know, a lot of it involves veneers, full mouth rehabs, implants. Also, if you're going to do a lot of that, you really need to somehow either team up with a great orthodontist or learn to encompass ortho in your practice. Uh, cause I'm very, I try to be very conservative and ortho is one of those treatments that allows you to be more conservative in your, in your smile makeovers. And so okay. I'd say, uh, you know, a lot of smile makeovers, veneers combined with some type of orthodontic treatment as well. Are you doing what percentage of that orthodontic treatment are you doing in office versus teamed up with an orthodontist? I'm doing the bulk of it in office. Oh, office. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, I remember you talking about, um, even like aesthetic crown lengthening, you know, obviously you're doing implants, you're doing some surgery. Do you do some uh, perio surgery? Yeah, I do perio surgery. I do, you know, aesthetic crown lengthening, um, biological shaping when we're doing reconstruction cases where sure. there's uh, that perio restorative interface that we have to correct or or rebuild. And so, yeah, a lot of surgery as well. Cool. Um, and and how soon after dental school did you realize like, okay, this is what I want to do? Like, what was that moment for you where you realized like, I like rebuilding people's smiles? My senior year of school. So okay. during my senior year of dental school, um, I took the Hornbrook Group's Continuum, which was uh, a live patient. We brought a live patient over multiple weekends. and We prepped them and designed them for veneers and seated veneers. So I started out actually my senior year, Dr. Hornbrook, who actually allowed us to come to that course. And we went and did it and it was awesome. And then I spent my kind of half my senior year, most of my senior year working out of another part-time dentist office who oh, wow. worked part-time at the school, but part-time in practice. So I was able to work under him and huh. he, his practice was pretty uh, pros driven, pretty aesthetic driven. And he allowed me to pretty much you know, do rehabs and small makeovers right there, you know, especially on the patients of his that maybe couldn't afford his fee. Sure. He allowed me to do it for a lot less. So he probably made Holy some cow. money off me, but <laughs> I got that experience there. And so doing all that, starting right in school, I knew what I wanted to do. And so when I came out, you know, that's what I set myself up as kind of more of a niche practice. That's amazing. So uh, it sounds like the Hornbrook continuum was a big influence on you. What other um, continuums do you really um, attribute some of your learning and early education in this from? Well, I, I started early on as a, a member of the AACD and a sustaining member and, and went through a lot of their courses, their um, continuum. I was president of the Idaho Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry for a while. Um, so a lot of the conferences there, uh, been to some, some of the down at the Spear Institute, you know, that was okay. a great place to learn. Okay, cool. Um, so was this ever hard for you? So you decide like, okay, this is the kind of dentistry I want to do. Um, you know, you open a practice. I Remind me the timing. I, it felt like the crash and you opening a practice were not greatly aligned. Yeah, I, I made some mistakes there. I came right out of school, built a practice. I built a brand new building um, right out of school back when banks would lend you anything you wanted. <laughs> I, I built a 9,000 square foot building. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. And I took and I took half of it for my office. Even 4,500 square feet is a lot for an office. But I took that for my office and then I left. I figured, well, I'll just rent the other half and the renters will pay my mortgage so I won't have to worry about it. Sure. And I set it up, um, 
you know, built a really nice office, you know, kind of more of a Taj Mahal type, you know, everything kind of high end. And then, yeah, the, the, basically the market just went out under on housing and it was a big crash right there. And I think I was one year out of school and I was probably two and a half million dollars in debt. Wow. You know, at about one year out of school with not with, a job, without a job, without a paying patient. You yeah. Know? Oh my goodness. Holy crap. So what, like, what'd you do at that point? Cause at that point you can't be just picky and only seeing, you know, the, the patients that, you know, well, you, you're, you're taking anyone. Like, how did you grow from, from nothing and that much debt? Well, I, I think, um, what I did was I still tried to stay in aesthetic practice. I guess I always viewed my practice as it's kind of got two parts of it. It's got its aesthetic side. It also has its general side, you know, but okay. because I marketed or was viewed as aesthetic kind of only my, my general side didn't really, you know, kick off and grow a whole lot. So I really, the aesthetic side just still continued to grow. You know, even during the downturn, I felt mm. like there were where everyone was running away from being, a, you know, doing aesthetic stuff and marketing or, or being that known as that kind of person in your community. I ran to it and I felt like I was, wasn't really competing with people and I was able to, you know, do the practice I wanted. And, cool. and so that, that side grew so much that really my general side didn't really end up having space to grow. Okay. No, that's awesome. So it sounds like um, you knew that this is what you wanted. It also sounds like uh, this is something that you've kind of always been good at helping people make this decision and accept treatment. Um, but what what are some of the main things that you would attribute your success in this area? So getting patients to accept elective treatment um, and major elective treatment, where it's not just you know you know five ten grand. You know your 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 your, your treatment plans are are kind of big sometimes, right? Like sure, they they, they might might range from a thousand dollars to eighty thousand, you know, sure. depending on the type of case we're doing and the type of patient, whether or not, you know, depending on what we're having to do. But really it comes to this, I guess I kind of identify there's three kind of patients, you know, out there. There's the existing patients in your office okay. that are seeing you and just been on the books and hygiene. You've done random things here and there. Those are the hard those are hard patients to convert into bigger, higher aesthetic need patients. Um, I didn't really focus a lot of why do you feel like the patients that are just there you know, like some people would say like, that's your, you know, your easiest go-to to, to find these patients because they're already in your office and they already trust you. I'm not pushy. I'm not a salesman. I, I don't do dentistry on anyone that doesn't ask me or sometimes even beg me to do it. So I'm not the type to bring up something. Well, you need this. Um, I'm just, I'm just not that type of personality where I'm going to push someone. I wait till I probably could do more dentistry if I learned how to be like that, but I want people to ask me. So, so for those patients, you know, I've already seen them. I've already diagnosed them. I'm not going to say, Hey, you need some veneers or you need some of this because really they don't. My, my philosophy is nobody needs any of this. This is all elective. I'm hmm. not Gonna, I never use the word need in my practice. I'm like, if you want this, we can do it. If not, whatever, I don't care. And I really think I do a good job of showing my patients I really don't care whether they choose treatment or not. I care more about, are they happy? Are they enjoying themselves? Am I, am I giving them what they want? So I think that translates over to patients. But existing patients, you just, you know, it's, it's kind of more difficult to bring up, hey, would you like to do this? Yeah. Um, sometimes the hygiene will bring it up, you know, because sometimes they'll confide in the hygienist and say, well, I, I really don't like this. And she might bring stuff up, but I'm never going to walk back in the room and I've been seeing the patient for years and say, hey, you know what you really need is this. I just, I just find that offensive. I wouldn't want my doctor to tell that to me, you know, so yeah. why would I do it? Now, the two easier are, are the new patients. The new patients that come in, you know, are problem focused. Some of them are more just like, I'm here for my checkup. They don't realize they have a problem issue. Ooh. They come in with a problem. Those are kind of easier ones to present because they're aware of their problem. And when they're aware of their problem, they're asking you for a solution. So those ones are kind of easier to hit. Another thing is the, like I, see, I do a lot of consults. Most of the patients that come through my office come through as a consult, not as a new patient exam. My new patient flow is pretty low. Um, it's more consults. It's more like, you know, if you can imagine like a plastic surgery office. People are just multiple consults a day just to kind of see you know, what's out there for me because a lot of a lot of patients view me as just kind of a cosmetic specialist. I don't do jet regular dentistry. So they just come to me for those those consults. So a lot of those are consults that are coming in specifically asking. Those are the easiest ones I think to find. And the way you're going to get those is from word of mouth of patients of your own um, that send people there or from proper marketing. So if you're doing the proper marketing and you're marketing aesthetic for aesthetic dentistry, those patients are actually going to come in asking for you. So you don't ever have to bring it up. They come in here saying, I don't like my smile. What are my options? I mean, those are the easiest to hit because you've got your solutions. You can show them what's possible 
and it's just you know they come in kind of primed and ready and that's kind of i think the a secret to doing a lot of these is being able to target a market to get that type of patient that's already coming in pre-prepped knowing what they want knowing kind of expecting what what things are going to cost and uh, okay. those are easier ones to hit and so you just have to have I never market like, hey, I'm a dentist. I market more procedures, you know, until a men are they're coming in for those specific procedures. Well, and it sounds like they, at that point, because they're coming into you, you have a reputation and they're referred or, you know, they've seen your work somewhere else. Then maybe they've seen your website and, and you have some of that trust baked in with those kinds of patients. Yes, that's exactly right. When you've built a brand, you've built a reputation, you've committed yourself to excellence on your dentistry. So when people see your dentistry out there, they're impressed by it. Um, they're asking, who did your veneers? Who did this? You know, you, you really build that. And then you get these consults, multiple consults coming in a day, basically already asking you, I want this. And there's really no barrier for them to accepting treatment other than, you know, finances or figuring that out. But they kind of come in all, all pre-prepped. And I've kind of, rather than built a practice that tries to get as many butts in the chair and try and hit them all up for whatever veneers or whatever smile makeover implants I can get and just throw it all at the wall and see what sticks, I've tried to build a slower practice, uh, less patients, more qualified patients that come in, you know, off that. And so I would rather them come in already asking for it. Yeah, no, that that definitely makes the whole process easier. I, I think I want to go back to what you said earlier, where you, you said you never use the word need. And a lot of times you kind of push back and say, like, hey, you know, we don't we don't really need to do this. Like, I, I feel like your ability to step back when maybe they're getting concerns or, you know, you, you've talked to me about this before we, and, and um, it really struck me. So describe to me, like, let's say there's a patient who comes in and is like, hey, I want some veneers. And you start talking about ortho and they're like, wow. I don't really want to do braces. I just want to do veneers. And they just kind of push back. What would be, what would you do at that point? Well, that that's actually one of the there's you do get pushed back when they come in asking for something and maybe you can't deliver what they want. Um, you know, that's when you just have to start, you have to make a decision in your mind. What am I willing to compromise? I have some patients that come in that I won't compromise. I, they need ortho before I can work on them. Yeah. They may not understand why. Um, and I do my best to explain to them. Those are patients where I'll try to use analogies. I'll say, look, the way your teeth are right now, you're not a great candidate for veneers. Could we do them? I guess we could, but here's the drawback. The drawback is X, Y, and Z, and that that's past what I'm willing to do for you. You know, you might find someone else willing to do that, but I don't want to do it to you because I know what's going to happen down the road. So you try to explain them that way. Let them know you just have concerns doing it that way. I let I always let people know we can do it if you want, but this is what you're in for. You know. Okay. Um, but I I I. I I rarely get people not wanting to do ortho. I try to use analogies sometimes. Like I, I since our office, I guess it kind of feels like a plastic surgery office because everyone's in there for something elective. You know, I'll put, I'll say, look, you know, if 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 a woman or a man or whoever comes to a plastic surgeon and you know wants to look like this model, but they're eight hundred pounds. You know, not saying that you're eight hundred pounds, by the way. <laughs> you know, the doctor might look at you and say, you know what, we could go chop all this off and make you skinny. But chopping that off is a huge, very invasive. You might not survive the surgery. You know, it might be drastic, lots of chances for infection or whatever. Why don't you go exercise for six months, lose 300 pounds? Sure. Come back to me and the surgery is going to be less invasive. You know, it's going to be easier on you. The results are going to look better. You're just going to be, and it's just six months. So we've, we've incorporated a lot of six month braces into our practice. You know, we use the power proc six month braces technique and, or of the liner therapy. And I put my patients through that a lot. I say, look, give me six months of exercise and I'll be able to give you much better, long lasting, healthier results. They tend to get some analogies like that. But but when someone someone pushes back, you know, I, I'll give an effort to you know clarify. But when someone, it's it's good to be able to read someone and know when there's pushback that you don't push them. You know, patients eventually come around. I often will tell patients, look, if you're not ready, why don't we just keep you in a holding pattern in our practice where you're seeing hygiene, I'm monitoring, making sure the situation's not getting worse, and then when you're ready, you tell me, we'll pull the trigger then. But I'll just put you in a holding pattern for now. And, and patients just like me, not pressuring them. I'm not going to tell you, you got to get this done by X, Y, Z, or you're going to suffer 
significant conflict, what am I going to use scare tactics um, in the practice? And I just find it's almost like a reverse psychology, but the, the less I want to do the treatment, sometimes the more they come around. So in your situation, there legitimately is no consequence to waiting. There is consequence to cutting corners. And so when you kind of push back and, and use that reverse psychology, um, it, it's, it's that like, you know, you get a girl's number and you don't call her for a few days on purpose. You know, it, it's just kind of one of those things where you, not that I get a lot of girls numbers, I'm married and, and I, you know, whatever. But uh, so, so do you f- see that as like an important part of, of why patients trust you? Yeah, um, partly because of my philosophy of dentistry. It kind of spills out when I'm talking to patients. It spills out on my staff. I mean, it's just the culture we have here is we're here to help you. We don't judge you. We're not going to pressure you. We don't care whether you do this treatment or not. You know, from, from our standpoint, we want to be the ones who do it. You know, I'll tell people, I said, you know what? I would love to do your case. I want to be the one to do it when you're ready. But we do not want to do this until you're ready, financially, mentally, or whatever. You know, and I tell them, I just said, I won't do it till you're ready. So go get ready. You know, I, I, I guess I, I try to, I've never viewed patients as like, I got to get to do this. Case. I got a boat payment to make, sure. you know, or I got this to get. If, when you're like that, it comes out. I don't, I don't have those payments to make. So I just, you know, I try to let my, my staff know I've never had a financial goal with my staff ever. I've never once said you have to close this case. You know, they don't care about whether I make money or not. Huh? So, um, no incentives, no financial goals, like no, no staff bonuses, nothing like that at all about what's good for the goose is good for the gander type of thing you know if it's if you treat your patients right there'll be enough there'll be enough to treat you to do um it's got to get you know those patients coming in and it does take time like i said it, i didn't build this overnight sure i wasn't trying to market to get you know 30 40 50 60 or 100 new patients a month and then try and pick from that i wanted to solely build a culture of doing the right patients at the right time um but certainly i think getting the right pre-qualified patients in the office is important. I think that's where your marketing plan and your culture are going to come in. Marketing needs to be focused on procedure-specific stuff if you're wanting to do some more of these patients. Okay, cool. What was the name of that company again? It was kind of cutting in and out. Dental Authority Marketing. Dental Authority Marketing. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're kind of a newer company, but they use some of these new online tools, click funnels, you know, sure. running your online ad campaigns. And, you know, basically they get me a lot of at bats is what I call. They, you know, they get me a lot of leads, and those yeah. are my our offices, our chances at bat to see if we can impress them or not. I had the pleasure of interviewing the founder, CEO, president of Design Ergonomics, Doctor Ahern, and my assumption was always, if I'm not doing a startup, I'm probably not going to be hiring Design Ergonomics or really being involved with them too much personally. What I've realized is that they aren't a company that's just about floor plans or about products. They're a company that's all about maximizing efficiency. So they have training products, resources for offices that are already established, but want to increase their productivity and take things to the next level. In fact, their dental reboot training, they actually have a guarantee that if you don't see a 20% increase in your productivity in the next four months, you get your money back on the forks. So if you want a taste of this information that you can begin to apply, go to desergo.com. And on the upper right hand side, it says work with us, click on that. And there's a little drop down that says guide to maximizing productivity. It's a $230 guide that they are offering for free to the listeners of the Shared Practices podcast. So put in Shared Practices for the promo code. The beauty of Dr. Ahern teaching these principles is that You know, I was thinking, oh, to work with design ergonomics as an established practice, I'd need to like remodel my practice or buy a bunch of equipment. His thought is if you apply these principles, you're going to increase your productivity and your efficiency to the point where, yeah, you totally could afford to do a remodel if you need to, or you could afford to take more time off, or you could do whatever you want with that. But the fact is, these are principles of manufacturing, of efficiency from multiple industries that they've brought in and applied to dentistry. This is powerful training. And once you read the guide, you're going to realize, okay, I want my team on board with this because that's really where the efficiency comes. That's when you go to dental-reboot.com. So dental reboot and get the over the shoulder training. Your team is going to understand there's going to be this light bulb moment where they get it and efficiency, productivity, the way they do things, the wasted chair time, the wasted supplies, all of that goes down. 
To learn more, check out the links in the show notes for the guide to maximizing productivity, a $230 guide that you're going to get for free, as well as a link to the dental reboot training. How how do you deal with financial issues? So when you get patients who are like, you know what, this is a lot of money. I don't know. You know, what are your tools that you allow patients to make things a little bit more affordable with, you know, like how much financing and other things, or how much do you kind of just say, you know, this is what it is. How, how do you manage those concerns? So a little bit of both. I'm, I'm notorious for not having systems in my consults. You know, I'll, <laughs> I'll listen to the patient. I'll shoot the breeze with them as long as they want. I'm not rushed, you know, because I don't run that kind of office and, and I'll listen to them. I'll speak with authority with them to them. And, you know, when they say it's expensive, my absolute, my response always is absolutely, it's a ton of money. You know, I will yeah. not deny it. This is a lot of money. Even a crown's a lot of money for some people. You know, we are expensive and I'm not the cheapest one in my area, probably the most expensive. And I'll tell them, I'll say, absolutely, this is expensive. And I won't justify my fees. I might sometimes say, you know, but that's for me to do what I do. That's what I have to charge. Yeah. You know, for me to be able to do my craft at the level I do it, that's what I have to charge. That's about the extent of me justifying a fee to a patient. But they'll always think you're expensive. You know, they're, they're kind of expecting a high fee. But it's good to let the patient know you understand it's expensive. Just say, I get it. This this is a lot of money. It's a huge investment, which is why we need to make sure you're ready to do it when you're ready. So, you know, I usually will at that point pass them off to my patient care coordinator who goes over all the financials with them. And there, there's that's important. I mean, as a doctor, I'm not scared to talk finances. You all throw out ballpark figures all the time. A patient usually overestimates so that when the girl comes in, you know, she, she has an easier like, time with it. Yeah. yeah. She sounds a little bit nicer, but sometimes I underestimate. And <laughs> says like, Hey, thanks for, you know, throwing that out there. <laughs> but when it comes to finances, I mean, we'll offer options from, you know, the traditional care credit. We'll finance patients, you know, through compassionate dental services. We'll, We'll also finance patients in office to a certain degree okay. you know, to allow patients. We lower some of the barriers. You can get burned. I've never really gotten burned, so I'm not too bothered by it. But we'll, we'll lower the barriers within reason. I kind of let my you know, financial aid decide you know, what she wants to do. I don't, I'm kind of firm in policy, but flexible in procedure. I think I learned that somewhere. But what's important is that person who's presenting the financials needs to be the patient's advocate. If they're, there, if they're the patient's adversary, like, hey, I'm the gatekeeper. You got to cough up the money before I let you through the door. Yeah. You know, it's just never going to work. You got to find someone who likes the patients, wants what's right for the patient. Not my job is to collect the money. It's my, I'm here to help you find the way to afford this. You know, and she'll sit down and she'll help them find a way. We're pretty flexible. She'll find some different ways to make it work for them, whether it's, you know, you drive how long it takes. If this takes us one month or 10 years, you decide, you know, we just, whatever it takes to fit within your budget. Because I always tell them it's important for me. It's, it's important to me that you can afford this, pay it, that you're happy to pay it. And if you're, if you're, you know, not able to make your mortgage because you're trying to do this, don't do it. Yeah. And so as an advocate, you're there helping them try and find a way to afford it, whether it's changing the treatment up, putting treatment off for months or a year until they can afford it. All those things are great. I mean, yeah, I don't have to do the treatment right now. If we got to do a layaway plan or something like that and do it in a year, sure. I do it in a year. You know, I'm just not, things they know that we're advocates of theirs. My financial lady is an advocate of theirs and I'm an advocate to get them what they want. That we're not people standing in the way of them getting treatment, you know? Yeah. No. And I think ironically, you know, you said that at the beginning of this, you're not a big sales guy and, you know, you're not going to a bunch of courses. I mean, we're doing a whole season on case acceptance, but I think this philosophy and an attitude does more a lot of times than specific tactics and systems and, and scripting. And, and all those things are good. Scripting is good. Having systems is good. But at the core of it, if they can just tell you really want this and you don't really care about them, but you want to do the treatment, you want the money, it's never going to work. And, and if you don't have all of these things, but they can tell at the heart of this that you care about them and you're an advocate for them, then maybe you don't need all of the sp systems built in if you can really convey that. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting. My The way I approach this really is a sales tactic. I mean, most salespeople would view this as a sales tactic. It's just not a sales tactic you can fake. It's not a sales, hmm. sales tactic you can really 
train to do because it really, like you said, it's a philosophy. You have to change your core beliefs and philosophy about your patients, about what you can do for them and that you care for them. And once, once you've got that, this is just kind of a natural extension of that. You don't have, like you said, that philosophy. Sure. Or you'll just have a, it'll come out. You'll be like hard pressed. I got to get this treatment sold. I got to make payroll. I got to make this. And, and that's just kind of a mindset too. I've always had the mindset of, I don't worry about finances. I, I don't think about that stuff. I think about doing what's right for the patient, finding a way to help them afford it, being low pressure, and there just tends to be enough enough patience and enough dentistry and enough money left at the end of the day to do what I want. Yeah. You know? I mean, I don't I couldn't tell you what I produce every month. It goes up and down quite a bit and I don't even sure. really track track it. You know, I don't discuss it with the staff like, hey guys, we didn't hit this this year, this month. What happened? You know, I don't, we just don't even have those conversations in the office. We have conversations about patients. Like, hey, let's go over a list of patients and what can we do to help them? Okay, well, this is interesting because, you know, so it, it sounds like you've managed to attract a team that shares this philosophy. So how much of building your culture and your team this way is, you know, hiring and, and, trial and error with with different people and how much of it is training and you communicating this on purpose and obviously it's both but talk to me about the process of developing a team like this it's hard i i went through a lot of staff you know i have been through a lot of staff sure partly because you know not hiring the right people or me not doing a good enough job of explaining my my vision to them and you know i'm i'm the type of person that i just like look follow my lead this is what i'm doing read my mind, you know, that doesn't always, <laughs> that doesn't always go over well with staff. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of, you have to get, eventually get staff that reads your mind or you, <laughs> or you have to learn to share your vision, you know, and I, and I don't think I go overtly sharing my vision with the staff. They just know we do a lot of great dentistry and they take pride in it and they want to be part of it. Sure. Okay. So part of, part of it's, you know, like you said, it's a combination finding the right people. And I found, I found some great staff, you know, some people that I think, you know, how they care about people. They're not just there for themselves. And that's, what's important. It's, it's one of those things that you can't train mm -hmm. and you, and you can't fake. And so sometimes you just have to go through enough people to find that team. Yeah. People buy from people they like. And so you got to have staff that like people and are likable. No, for sure. Well, um, if you don't mind, do you mind if we go back to some more specifics some some more analogies you said you have a lot of analogies you like to use so we we, we talked about the uh what's that show right now my 500 pound life that's my wife loves that show the the losing weight analogy what are some other analogies that you use to describe your specific procedures to your patients oh well hmm I'm trying to have to think there are that sometimes they just come to me when i'm I know, talking right? to a patient you know, like I, I use that one because we talked about ortho. Ortho is always someone people always put up barriers about. We do a lot more bracket therapy than we do aligner therapy. Yeah. Which is interesting because they're all adults. And you'd think adults would never, you know, never touch a lot, touch anything but aligners. They don't want brackets on their right, teeth. Right, right. But we managed to convince all our almost all our patients who want aligner therapy to go into brackets, you know, because huh. we can do them quicker and faster and less cost to the patient. And I get okay. a little bit more accurate. You know, I use things, you know, I try to let patients know like, hey, you know, people view adults with braces differently than they used to. It's not the same. They, they view them as someone who's taking care of themselves, someone who's investing in their health. More of a, it's more of a status thing there. People don't look at it like you're a teenager. They look at it as someone who's investing in their health. You know, I try to reframe. I'm, I'm really good at reframing with my patients who put up barriers. I try to get them to reframe in that way. You know, other analogies, I mean, you know, I mean, there's the, there's the typical analogies, um, like for implants, for example, you know, you want to avoid using words like we're going to screw this thing in your head, <laughs> and, you know, we're going to torque it down and then stick a post on it. I really don't get technical with my patients. Yeah. Most of them don't want to, cause they're all kind of middle-aged, you know, women, you know, like middle-aged attractive women, and they don't really necessarily want you know, to be the nuts and bolts of yeah, they're not engineers, and, you know, yeah. they're, they're more of the type, like, tell me what this can do for you. And so you'll change that if you're dealing with the guys and more of an engineer type. And there are certainly treatment planning courses out there that teach you how to identify what kind of person it is and custom tailor. But yeah, I yeah. find it's best just to, just to be natural with them, especially with the women, you know, we'll talk about, well, this is, you know, if you want to know the technical aspect, aspect it's as simple as, you know, an implant's broken up in two parts. There's a, we replace the root inside the bone and then we replace the tooth above the gums. Don't worry, it's going to look beautiful. You're not even going to have any stitches. You know, you're not going to miss any work. It's going to go great. You know, that's, that's pretty much how the conversations go. 
Yeah. Okay. We, 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 we don't get very technical very often, mostly just because I'm doing with women who don't necessarily want the te- technical, you know, the value of it. And so, you know, we explain to them what it's going to look like. We use digital, you know, imaging to show them what it's going to look like after. Yeah. So how much photography are you doing? How much, you know, smile makeover software, you know, what are the tools that you use to kind of help people see what you're seeing and realize where they can go? Photography is going to be key to anyone who's wanting to do these types of consultations. These consultations shouldn't be done without photography. Okay. Now, you might get the odd patient that says, ah, oh, take that photo down. It's horrible. You know, I mean, sure. it might happen once every other couple of years, but most people want to see the pictures. Take a lot of good photography. In fact, the, the biggest issue I have with photography is pulling up a big old picture of the lady's smile. She's got crooked, jacked up teeth. And all she can tell is, you know, she's got a little bit of a mustache. You know? <laughs> You're like, no, I, I can't tell you how many times that's happened. And I have to like zoom in and make yeah. sure no lip is involved. <laughs> they just stare at that. And, you know, can't stare at that. <laughs> oh, no. Good photography is always going to be important. I think you should take, you know, get a good set of photos. And what I do is I, I sometimes will just, I'll airdrop them, you know, onto, you know, our iPad right there. And the patient has them sitting in their lap. Yeah. I'll actually airdrop the photos to them. They don't, if they can just text message them, I'll just select them all and text message them. Then they'll have those photos when they go home. Nice. Because sometimes they're, they want to think about it. They sit yeah. there and stare at it and they have nightmares about it. Maybe they'll call you back. <laughs> so here's a good sales tactic. Drop, you know, plant nightmares in your patients by Perfect. sitting home with their photos. One Perfect. way is to actually even grab their phone and take a few photos with their phone. Well, so, so what do you, how much of the photography do you do yourself versus having your team do? It's kind of mixed up, just in the room at the time and, and wants to grab them. And, you know, I, I still take some of them. I don't really have a hard and fast rule. Sometimes my staff has to run out and, you know, do an ortho chair or something. Yeah. There, I'll take them. But I think it's key to have them. But even more key is to get them to the patient. I think text them to them right there. They have those pictures. You know, talking with the spouse, they want to be able to show, them, hey, this is this is what's going on. You probably never saw it. You probably didn't notice this, you know, up close. But here here's what my teeth are. Yeah. As far as helping to close consults, photography, you know, is, is, is a great avenue for that. Are you doing this with like a DSLR with like, yeah, you know? I, a DSLR, a good set of retractors and a good set of mirrors. Mirrors. Okay. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. What are, what are your um, like go-to shots? You like repose, full so smile. I'll take, I'll take a full smile. I'll take a retracted photo. Typically. I mean, I take the AACD full series, you know, okay. typically. But some other ones I like that are just, if you're looking for a quick and easy, some for the patients, you know, the retracted with the mouth open slightly so they can see the lower teeth as well as the top teeth. Sometimes quadrant, or I mean, uh, full occlusal shots are tricky to take Yeah. for these patients. Sometimes uh, just do quick four quadrants. Okay. So say we're dealing with a bread and butter patient that just got needs quadrant dentistry, you know, something, yeah. something updated four quadrants it's for areas of their mouth. Okay, cool. So that's 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 a big one I take. If like if I notice this isn't an aesthetic needed patient or aesthetic minded, I'm not gonna take a photo and say, Hey, do you want your smile fixed? Like I said, I kind of find that a little bit I like them to ask me, but so in those types of patients where I know we're not really diving into it's like No, no, that sounds great. And and I think it's one of those things that if you're not comfortable taking photos, it just takes a while. You have to take enough, you have to, you know, those continuums that you go do, you know, for two years of, of my residency just now that I finished, like we had to take photos on all our patients and then we had to present them and get grilled on the photos and the angles and the lighting and the balance and all that. And eventually it becomes just natural and something that you can do quickly. But if you want to do these kind of cases, it's it's, it's necessary. Yeah. If you, if you want one tactic to, to cl- I guess as we're talking about closing cases, whether it's aesthetic or reconstructive implant, you name it, photography is going to be it. And I always tell people, you know, if, if, if you don't, not every dentist or doctor has the patience or the skill set to be that type of communicator, you just have to be likable. If you're that type, surround yourself with staff that are better communicators. I, I mean, yeah. I do a lot of practice coaching. So I have doctors who I will do a lot of clinical coaching with, but part of the yeah. clinical coaching that I do is teaching them, you know, how to surround themselves you know, or build a certain skill set. And if they don't have it, I don't want to push it with them. I want them to surround themselves with staff that, that have those skill sets. You know, if you don't and your patient staff and your staff do, I think you'll probably have pretty close to as high acceptance rate. Sure. If you just stick to what you're good at, you know, maybe diagnosing and explaining things, but then have staff that come in afterwards and clean up 
you know, what you said and, yeah. you know, explain it to the patient better and, or maybe the, maybe the staff are a little bit more likable than you are, sure. you know, and that's common. I mean, I'm sure it's common in my office too, but having the right staff will also help make up for maybe some of your skill set that isn't quite there. So say you had a doc that you were coaching that, that asked, Hey, you know, like I want to get better at building rapport with patients. Like what, what would be a go-to set of questions that either you ask every time or that you could offer to someone else? So for, for example, I tend to ask people where they're from and I also ask them what they do. I'm in the army, so it doesn't really matter per se my rapport as much right now because they all, my case acceptance is hundred percent because they have to be there. But, yeah. but that usually allows me to latch onto something and then talk to them and relate to them and, and kind of get to know them in that way. What, what are some things that you ask people? Like, how do you shoot the breeze with people? I rarely bring up what they do for a living, okay. you know, cause I hate it when people ask me what I do for a living. When they, people ask me what I do for a living, I'm like, well, I snow ski, I mountain bike, I surf, I backpack, <laughs> I fish. They're like, no, what do you do for a living? I'm like, that's what I do for a living. You mean, what do I do to pay for it? You know, <laughs> I, I, this question always just bugs me. So I never ask anyone what they do unless they bring up, oh yeah, my work brought me out here. And sometimes my hygienist will chime in like, oh yeah, he works for so-and-so or he's out here doing this. Yeah. Sometimes it'll just come up, but I typically don't ask. I actually like to ask people what, what they do for fun. You know, cool. I'm like, oh, or what, have you done anything fun since we last saw you or anything new and exciting? And you know, some people, every half the people's response are like, no, same old boring thing. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that's a lie. You have, to have done something fun. You know, I said, I'm always looking for new ideas. So I need some new ideas and stuff to do. So I, you know, I like to pick people's brains about fun stuff they do Yeah, and, you know, show an interest like, man, I'm going to go try that. And I do. I, a lot of times I'll go out and try or I'll go hit that fishing spot they told me about or go, yeah. you know, hike that area they're talking about or go see some event that they're talking about. So I always like to get people to talk about what fun stuff they do. No one wants to talk about work because barely does anyone have anything enjoyable about work. You know, sure. when you start talking about work, then stress sits in, you know, and their, their demeanor changes unless they like really love what they do, but that's few and far between. You get them talking about the fun stuff they do, then it's just a much more enjoyable conversation, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, that's a great little you know, like specific strategy that I think that that the positivity of that interaction makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'll only talk about work if they bring it up, and then I'll you know I'll express some interest. But you know, as they always say, it's better to listen than to talk about yourself. You know, just like when you're dating women, you know, don't the more you talk about yourself, the less likely you're gonna you know seal the deal. So yeah, it's better it's better to listen, and that's true. So I like to ask them, especially about what they like to do, because when they're talking about that, their demeanor changes. They're excited, you cool. know, and uh, and you get to talk to them about how interesting that is, and you know, they're more likely to hear what you have to say. I think after that, at least if you can be on some positive subject. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, yeah. with, with older people, sometimes it's about their grandkids, you know, because that's what they've been doing, spend their time. Sure. I like to be, keep the conversations pretty positive. On on that note, one of the things I did want to bring up on the podcast was your recent trip to wrap this up. So you uh, were, were posting some pictures of a pretty, pretty amazing trip that you took recently. Tell us about that. Well, uh, yeah, we recently took a trip to Ethiopia to go do some dental missionary work. And, you know, I've always liked dental missions and, and I've, you know, donated to this company for a long time. And then an opportunity came up now that my kids are old enough, I can drag them along. And so nice. I took, I left my four youngest at home, but I took my two oldest who were 15 and 17 and my wife with me. And we went to Ethiopia and it was, it was a great experience. I mean, it was, it was truly humbling and it was challenging. The reason I took this They'd been needing someone to go here for a long time because dentists rarely will ever visit this part of Ethiopia because it's yeah. the mountains. It's way up north in the mountains, small villages. It's not like your typical get to hang out in a resort, make it a vacation, and then work yeah, three yeah. or four days You know, in the clinic, donate time. This is no running water, no electricity, lucky to have a concrete floor and something oh over cow. your head in order to do dentistry. And so, and then the need is high because no one will go there. So I was like, yeah, I take enough fun vacations. I, I'm okay. I'll do this one. I'll do the hard one. And it was way harder than I thought. It was truly like, you think poverty, this was 10 times worse than I could imagine. Oh. I couldn't, you know, you just couldn't, you couldn't fill the need. It was kind of hard. I mean, we, you know, my wife and I, she assisted me. And then my kids, you know, my daughter who's 15, she saw all the kids, you know, she probably saw about 150 kids a day. You know, Holy where cow. she would teach them how to brush their teeth, screen them to see if they had cavities, which a lot of them did. Yeah. 
before I do oral hygiene instruction, you know, and screen them for me. But the need was so high, you know, that's all you could do. There was just, you know, we pulled about a thousand teeth in a week. Wow. We were there 12 days. It was hard. I can just imagine just like sweating and pulling teeth and having stuff go wrong and not having all the tools at your disposal that you normally would have to... Yeah, no handpiece, no x-rays. Ugh. I was extremely lucky to only have one or two teeth that really kicked my butt. Everything came out just just so nicely. I mean, it was it was so lucky. But yeah, I brought a lot of my own special instruments to you know, make sure, sure I had everything. But you know, my son sterilized all the instruments and rotated and set up the rooms. But you set up shop in a place like this and you have hundreds of people in a day lining up to see you and you can't see them all. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we'd have to turn people away. In fact, the last day, we slipped in a couple extra four hours in the morning before our flight left to go back to a village just to see some more people. Wow. And yeah, it was truly humbling. I mean, poverty conditions, but they're, they're gorgeous and the kids are beautiful. And the, the guys are kind of goofy looking, but the... You know, <laughs> The people are just, they're, they're just really, you know, grateful. Yeah, it was a true, it was a hard, hard experience, but huh. it was definitely worth it. I'm glad I went. I'll for, I'll for certainly go back to this place. That's nuts. And you'd walk out and there'd be like a hundred people just in a crowd, just like wanting to get in and you just have to turn around and be like, I don't have time for this. I got to go back to work, uh, you know? So it was, it was, you were the only dentist? Yeah, I was the only dentist. And so we had some nurses with us that were kind of screening people for classes or for other issue, health issues and trying to, you know, uh, some nurses and some PAs there and some surgical techs that were just doing kind of some stuff on the medical side. But since the need was so high in dentistry, I actually had ended up recruiting nurses over to my air to, to come over and work with me. Yeah. And so, you know, I gave them a, a you know, a headlight and had them go through the line and screen that showed them what to look for, you know, because yeah. it was so obvious. They knew what to look for and they would identify the patients that needed work. I taught them how to give shots and blocks and everything. You know, it was kind of like a monkey see, monkey do thing. Yeah. Showed them a few times and they just went, we went and identified and they were numbing patients, it, you know, so that I could see a patient. Actually, that's the point. We were so busy. I started getting extra chairs and taught the nurses how to pull teeth. So yeah. any, anything that looked like, you know, within the realm of not, not too complicated, yeah. I just, just pull it, just pull it. Don't worry. If you blow it, I'll, I'll bail you out, but we just got to get through all these people. And so we basically had, I had the nurses giving shots, nurses pulling teeth. You know, I would jump from chair to, you know, from table to table. And these were like, like tables, hardly any padding, if any, no padding on them. Some of them wow. were like, is a desk, you know, and just flies everywhere. I mean, there's a bucket on the ground with a dried placenta in it, you know, because they'd been, oh. you know, delivering, delivering babies in this room. Wow. You know, it was just kind of really just hard conditions, but you just had to suck it up and realize, you know, you just got to do what you can do. So th this, this sounds like both amazing opportunity, but also really brutal. Would you recommend if someone was like a dental student and heard this and was like, holy cow, I want to go take out that many teeth and, and help these people out? Um, do you think that'd be a, a, a valuable experience or do you think that'd be like too much for someone who's like, doesn't no. have some surgical years under their belt? No, I think it'd be great. Cool. I mean, it just, I, I think it'd be a great experience. You just have to realize, you know, some dentistry is better than, you know, no dentistry. No dentistry. Yeah. Anything you can do to help them. You know, you, you make a difference. You, you definitely make a difference. In fact, when I go back, you know, I'm going, I'm going to be taking more help with me. Yeah. We've kind of, as a family decided since I'm bringing a partner in, I can take more, you know, take, take longer time frames off. We're going to spend a month each year, you know, living in a different country where we'll work three or four days in the clinic and then just enjoy the country three or four days a week and spend a whole month there with my family. Cool. And, you know, I'd like to have, you know, other doctors or students come if it's yeah. for a week, week at a time and I can get everything ready and they can help us. And so that'd be awesome. When, yeah, I, I, I would definitely need help. When's your next trip? I'll probably next summer. Okay. I, I, I might do them in the summer because that's when my kids are off school. Yeah. And it's important for me, for my kids to be involved and do this. Sure. No. And, and what did they think? Like, did this... Were, were uh, I think you mentioned maybe a son who was interested in dentistry when you're on the T-Bones podcast. Is it still, still interested? Yeah, he's still interested. He came along and, you know, he did great. My kids actually did better than me. I kind of sometimes get a little cushy, you know, where I need a resort and, you know, some, some kind of food, <laughs> you know, and I get a little spoiled, but this was, you know, trying to decide between sleeping with bed bugs or a rat, you know, wow. and 
not eating for a week and a half because the food, you know, just what, you know, in those type of conditions, you're not sure what to eat. Yeah. You don't want to get sick. And so you don't eat, you know, and so you're battling, you know, trying not to get malaria. And, <laughs> you know, you're not sure about the food. So you pick it, you know, I pretty th- think I just ate candy bars the whole time I was there because it was packaged. So I knew, Holy it cow. Sick. but, but def- definitely a, a good, good experience for him. And I, I think he'll, it was good for him. Cool. Well, uh, if people want to reach out to you, if they're interested in coming on a trip like this with you, what would be a good way? Is it Facebook, email? What's the easiest way? Yeah, face, Facebook's great. If you just message me on Facebook, that's usually the easiest way. Okay, cool. Yeah, usually if you email me, it gets sometimes stuck. I, I might forget to get to it, but usually Facebook Messenger, I'm pretty good about getting back on. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. This this was a lot of fun and uh, oh, you're welcome. just a, a chance to shoot the breeze and, and uh, learn from you. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Cool. Well, this was Dr. Wade Pilling. Pretty amazing experiences 